name is Suleiman Wadudi. I live in the city of Toronto with my family. I've been in this country for 33 going on 34 years. Alhamdulillah, I'm raising children and a family in this country with the intention of reconstructing a life along spiritual revolutionary lines. Alhamdulillah, so far, it's a privilege, an honor really, to be a part of this religion, to follow the ways and methods of the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi. And it has become my life, my life's path, and the nourishment and the risk that maintains me. I'm grateful for it. I don't think I follow the religion. I think I, I had a religious influence and I was asked to go to church on occasion, many of which, many a time, I did not. <laughs> but um, I had no real religious inclination. But I need to qualify this by saying that I had religious influence very young, 19, I started questioning a lot of things. If there is a God, why is there ugliness in the world? If there is a God, why are some people doing well and some people suffering? If there is a God, why is it there is death and humiliation for some and ease for others? Understand I'm a black person, I've seen a lot of that. I've read a lot about it, even at a young age. So this was a question that was predominant in my mind. And it began my search for answers, my search for an idea, a principle, a way of life that would allow me to empower myself and to eliminate the possibility of falling into the trap of oppression. That was how it began. I had been reading a lot, spending a lot of nights taking notes, making comparisons with biblical personalities, and studying the prophetic personality of our beloved prophet. And I had reached a point where, like a, like a cup filled, I was overflowing. I couldn't take it. I literally couldn't take it anymore emotionally. I, I had to do something. I felt like if I did not become a participant in the methodology of this man that I had now embraced as a mentor, as a guide, that I would be in a state of loss. So I called a friend of mine who I knew to be a Muslim and I asked as to where I should go to become a Muslim. He, was, he gave me the directions and the advice. It was at 56 Boosted Avenue in Toronto. And I went there on my own. And for the first time, I saw how Muslims prayed. It touched me. I felt the atmosphere of the masjid. I hadn't felt that before. The way the men lined up and prayed, and when they were finished, the way they greeted each other, moved me. So at the end, I looked for the kindest face that I saw in the audience, and I called him, and I said, Brother, I would like to become a Muslim today. He looked at me with, he looked at me with a, a look of surprise, and held me by the arm, and led me to the Imam's office. His name was Abdullah Idris, he was from the Sudan, a very kind, gentle soul. And I told him my story. And he started muttering words in Arabic, maybe for about two or three minutes, that I did not understand. But in the end, he bent his head and he said to me, Do you know what you are doing today? I said, I believe so. He said, This doesn't happen like this. I said, I. I wouldn't know. I just know this is what I want. And tears was in his eyes. I could see the tears welling up in his eyes. And he gave me my shahada. 
I swear, from that day, and maybe for another two or three weeks, I actually felt like I was walking on clouds. It was a beautiful feeling for three weeks to a month. And I came down gradually after, but that was how I came. My first experience or experiences in coming into the general community of Muslims was of a dual nature. There were some people that were extremely kind and extremely good and, and caring. And some of them reached out sincerely. You, you can feel it. And my sister, there were some that were not so much that. I experienced racism. I experienced elitism. And um, I was surprised because when you're impressionable, you, you tend to think that things are perfect. Especially when you're making a transition from one way of life to another way of life. You have illusions of grandeur. You shouldn't, but you do. And there were some painful experiences that I had to come to terms with. But it's life, you know. Islam is one thing and it's adherents and followers are another thing. And it's, it's not unfair to say that people are evolving, whether they are in Islam or outside of Islam. I feel that humanity is in a state of evolution. Uh, Muslims tend to think that they are the only ones evolving, but I don't believe that. I believe people are evolving and there are some people who are not practically Muslims, but are Muslims in disposition. And Allah knows what he will do with them over the course of time. But um, my experience within the Muslim community really is really of dual nature. There are some people that have left strong, positive impressions upon me up till now that I love them, I will bleed for them. And there are some I have to work very hard so that I don't harbor ill feelings towards them for the negativity that I see them, some still perpetrate against others. Mm -hmm. But it's life. Sure. Coming into Islam, when I embraced Islam, the Quran had great meaning. But before the Quran, it was the personality and character of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And what made me comfortable with that line of thinking and direction of movement was that I had read that he was the embodiment of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So by synopsis, I said to myself, if this personality is a Quranic personality and I am so engaged and moved by it, then the Quran would be the antidotal property for my healing and liberation. And then after that kind of thinking, I began its reading. I found it poetic, fluid, simple but not simplistic, attractive. Perhaps in those days, the more attractive surah of the Quran for me would have been Simply Surah Al-Fatiha because it condenses everything of the Quran. And two, Surah Al-Rahman. Mm -hmm. Which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? You know, the Prophet Muhammad is a beacon like no other beacon. He's a light like no other light. He doesn't shine in one direction. <laughs> he shines in the multifaceted direction of the human personality. He covers every nook and cranny of the human personality. He's husband, mystic, social activist, prophet, preacher father, ascetic, 
warrior, jurist, poet, literary genius. Every field of human endeavor that he touched, he crystallized in the most actualized way for a human being. He is indeed Al Insan Al Kamil, the perfect man. So, he, for me, is Islam. And the more I found myself attracted to him, it's the calmer and the more peaceful I found myself to be. And trust me, I was a very angry, hurt person. And he brought a sort of peace to me, not healing quite yet, but peace and hope that I would find healing for myself. The process is ongoing, yet, because this is the movement of humanity. But I will tell you this. There is nothing fanciful about the Prophet Muhammad. He's not an illusion. He's a very, very real personality. And this is what makes Islam very powerful, in that he's not a figment of the imagination. He's a very real person that lived and walked and ate and evolved. Most importantly, he's the personality who did mirage. He went from the terrestrial to the absolutely celestial and spiritual. It means that he went from the lowest to the highest, where no other being, human or otherwise, had gone before. My first couple of years in Islam were as much a learning experience as it was a critical experience. The people that I see, that I saw practice in Islam, I had certain, I had a certain degree of discontent with what I saw. It was very male chauvinistic. It was very totalitarian. And I saw a lot of women being treated in a way as if they were brainless. I didn't like that. Secondly, if probably more important, the powers given to the Amir, so-called Imam in the Jama'ah that I was functioning in, was limitless. If he said, give your money, you give your money. If he said, rent your basement, you rent your basement. If he said, come to the mosque at two o'clock in the morning, you go to the mosque at two o'clock in the morning. For me, it, it was not a democratic process. It, it, it almost was like a totalitarian type of rule, Machiavellian even at times. So my soul, protested that. So, even I knew nothing of Shiism, my quest began again. So now I started to read the Quran in a more critical, analytical way. And I came across Surah 33, Ayat 33, the Ulul Amr. Who are the Ulul Amr? When I asked the Sunni people, they said, that's the Imam of the Masjid. He has these powers. You are supposed to obey him because the Quran is commanding you to obey Allah and his Prophet and those invested with authority amongst you. It's clear in the Quran. But I said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he be praised and glorified, laid down a criteria for his prophet to establish him as a prophet, there must be a criteria laid down for the Ulul Amr if you are to give them undivided, unquestionable obedience. I was a Sunni. I couldn't accept that a man who was a despot should have my undivided obedience and devotion. I couldn't accept that. And when I brought it on the table, put it on the table, I was criticized and threatened at that age. 
21 years old, I was told that if I didn't obey the imam or I questioned him, that I could be flogged. Imagine my background and being told this. <laughs> I could not accept it. And in that book, it made reference to Surah 33, Ayat 33. And when I read it, the lights went on. Subhana Rabbi Alaveen. And from that point, I was attached to Imam Hussein as a point of study. La ilaha illallah. And I saw the Prophet Muhammad in a different light, in this personality. One as the bringer of the message, now this one as the protector of the message. And the criteria to hold the power to protect that message. So I went from that stage to the next stage. Within a month, I said, Ashhadu an la, Amir al Muhmineen, Ali and Wali Allah. And the transition from Sunnism to Shiism became crystallized. And so it has been from that time till now. It probably was maybe a year and a half into accepting Islam that I came across the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt, alhamdulillah. I did not feel deprived or misled or misguided. I, I really didn't feel that. Why, I'll tell you. I'm one of those that believe that Sunnism, if sincere, is a good religion. I, I truly believe that. I'm not a sectarian. I will not practice sectarianism, even though there is sectarianism amongst Sunnis and Shias in attitude. I do not have a sectarian attitude because I understand the meaning of disharmony. I understand the concept of fitna and what it does for eroding the human spirit and the fabric of human society. So I will not practice sectarianism. But I will practice and embrace the truth as I understand it. Shiism, for want of a better term, is the cream of Islam. No one can deny that. It speaks for itself. It doesn't even have to shout loudly. The people who are Shia in essence, in their very disposition, in the very network of their nervous system, whose hearts and minds pulsate, with the idea and the emotion of Shiism are those who simply are blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has nothing to do with if you were raised in it. Because you might be raised in it and you may do martyrdom and you might do salawat, but that does not mean that you are moved by it. Shiism is a kind of inner awakening, a kind of inner movement that affects the mind and the emotions with the equal intensity, that you cannot help that be drawn to it. You can't help it. This is why Shiism is for the sincere. It is for the devout. It is for those who have a class sincerity. And this is why I believe that it is not the understanding of Shiism is not contingent on dawah. We have to do dawah and tablik. It's an obligation. But this is not what will make people Shia. Shiism comes from yearning, an emptiness that has to be filled, that has to engulf you. And when you want to be engulfed by light and truth, you will undoubtedly find yourself there, no matter what is your point of origin. This is my belief. What was beneficial in my first Muharram though, was the stories, the anecdotes from the experience, the historical backdrop. I am a bit of an intellectual, so I need that kind of thing. I, I need to be able to, to put a picture together. And it was epic. I thought it was epic. The snippets that I got from them lectures was that 
this caravan of souls knew its destination, knew its end, but embraced it with a fervor and conviction that was extraordinary and unusual. I'm used to revolutionary activity, I've studied them, but this one was like no other. The personalities were out of this world, for want of a better term. And what they demonstrated, I don't think those of us who beat our chest for them, I don't think we, do, we get it. I will go out on a limb and say, I don't think we get what transpired on that usher a day on those hot sands of Karbala. The bloodshed, the ugliness, the beauty, the extraordinary beauty, the otherworldliness that was demonstrated on that day by old people, middle-aged people, children, infants, before that, in my consciousness, what resonates with me is the Christians speak to the crucifixion of Christ Jesus, which is a fallacy as we know. But they dramatize it in such proportions that it moves people to tears. And people think that this is the, the one event that they must embrace for salvation. But when I reference it against the Karbala paradigm. It's nothing. It's nothing. This is one man, a prophetic personality, albeit. But then you have a prophetic personality in the personality of Hussein ibn Ali, Sayyid al-Shuhuda. And then you had 72 others that are made up of people and children. But the personalities. Oh, la ilaha illallah. The epic nature of their personalities. It's timeless, my dear sister. Up till now, they are relevant and pertinent and real to our circumstances, social, economic, and cultural, now as it was then. They are relevant. So, my first Muharram, yes, overwhelming and engaging. My most recent Muharram, overwhelming and engaging. It hasn't changed. Anyone, no matter your background, who have the good fortune and blessing to come to a juncture in their life where they are considering embracing faith, especially Islam, and particular Shiism, I advise them first to begin to keep their minds open. Keep an open mind. Be aware of your prejudices and sublimate them as much as possible. Understand that you are entering into a new culture that perhaps doesn't resemble anything in yours and that you must not be prejudiced and that you must read and then read and then read. And after you've done all of that reading, you must pray and then pray, and then pray some more diligently, fervently, enthusiastically, lamenting over who you are and where and where and who and how you want to be. And how do we want to be? I would advise any newcomer, anyone interested in Islam, use the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi. Use them as symbols iconic paradigms, unshifting as your models. Study their lives. Study the politics, political and social conditions of their existences, but study their devotion and their commitment to their ideology and their consciousness of God. If anyone can do this even in small degrees, it will yield for them 
tremendous benefit. This would be my advice. To people who are born into Islam, especially in these days where there's a gathering of souls, so to speak. I encourage those who are born into Islam to be careful with reverts. They're coming from different places and different life experiences. Some of them very fragile, some of them very stable. Be aware of this. And for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, serve these circumstances and people best you can because they are the messengers of Allah. There's an important and powerful hadith of Ahl al-Bayt where it says, the destitute are the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look for people who are destitute, especially the destitute that have embraced faith because you don't know where they will finish. Their position in the end may be so lofty that it would suit you to serve them. And all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And blessings and benedictions be upon our beloved Muhammad wa Ali and those who follow them through successive generations. Mm -hmm.